it almost brought a tear to my eye. This the second person that came in when we opened on the 30th of July, 22. And they, well, they, roll, they rolled up in a wheelchair and we were like, okay, cool. Like we tried our best to in factor all this into the, much of the design as we could. And we're like, okay, number two, right, we're going to tie. And um, one of the ops managers met the person at the end and um, he was like, he was blown away. He was like, this is the like one of the first times I felt that I could, I was, it was almost designed as for as much for us as it was for others. Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. On this podcast, we talk to an amazing range of people. And we talk to these people about risk. Risk they've taken in their lives, risk they've taken in their careers, when they paid off, and when they didn't. And on this episode, I am blessed to be joined by the one and only Graham McFoy. Graham is the co-founder of Wake the Tiger. He's been part of the Boomtown Festival strategic operations team for a few years now, for a long time, five years now? Yeah, five years. Five yeah. years now, and has had over 20 years experience in live events. Graham, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So fascinated by the journey, because we, we spoke for the first time about 18 months ago. Um, obviously, I was aware of Boomtown, having gone many times before, and then when you took me through the concept for Wake the Tiger, my mind was blown, because <laughs> it was just such a ambitious project to, for them, from where I saw it, to take such a, a high-concept, immersive experience and make that work for the masses, make it work in that way where, you know, having been to Boomtown Festival, it's such a magical experience with so much immersion and thinking, okay, I, I see how just about they managed to pull this off for three days, let alone year round, right? So I was blown away by that concept and it's been so exciting to see the growth of the business and the journey. So, you know, wh where did Wake the Tiger start? T talk to me about the creative process for, for building something like that. Oh yeah, well, um, it's it's sort of been long. It's been brewing over quite a lot of years. Um, Luke, who's the creative director at Boomtown, one of the founders there, and also the creative director at Wake the Tiger, him and me had been just doodling backwards and forwards for years, and just talk of this a permanent venue and a, like, you know, we loved the Imagineers and on Disney Plus, and just we've watched that multiple times. And he's been to Disneyland all the time, and he he. He loves building worlds and he's very good at it. And um, yeah, so we doodled loads of ideas and, but I don't know, life, business, it, everything just gets in the way. And we, the boom tennis is a beast, a beast of a festival. So many layers. It's like nothing else in, in, in the country. Um, but the pandemic hit. And once we got the company all sorted out with all the furloughs and everything else that you have to do, it gave us that opportunity to, to take a moment and sit down and go, right, okay, cool. You know, what are we going to do? And, Boomtown owned where the Boomtown office is 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 the the owned this warehouse which they had a nightclub in before the pandemic for three thousand people and all stuff and they'd only done like four nights in the pandemic kit and that was the end of that oh right okay it was the biggest nightclub in the southwest it was epic um and they uh, yeah, were like what are we gonna do with this and so we so we just started getting into it and 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 looking at it and we we went through quite a lot of different things before we before we even you know, came to wait the tiger like you know should we do like a you know, jazz cafes or like, you know, just some, I don't know, some art style based venue. Mm -hmm. Like, and we, we had a, we've been chatting through a few different things and had a meeting with a, a guy called James Wheel who works for Innovate UK who said, listen, just, just do what you're good at. Storytell, build a world. It sounds so obvious <laughs> now, but like, so, so we, I mean, most people get told to build a world. I mean, it feels pretty daunting. Yeah. So we were like, yeah, good. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. So we, so we sort of started focusing on, on that and, um, yeah, it just, it just started taking shape. It, it took quite a while cause we were coming up with, well, we'd had ideas and doodles over the years. Mm. They're very high level, very top line. So when you start going, right, we're actually going to do this, it, yeah. it, it, it's a different level of detail that you need to come into. So it was the formatting the company, raising the investments, working out what we are, finding a name, which was awful. <laughs> um, a horrendous experience I never want to go through again. Um, um, but we're happy with you know with where we ended up. And and then bringing in the right people that, that worked with us in the past and to, to start formulating and and creating that seed of an idea which we can then we can then grow with a wider team mm. and so many things that I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated to ask you about around this because obviously when we were talking about doing the podcast you sent over some helpful information and some of the words you used when you were talking about 
building Wake the Tiger was really interesting. Um, talking about manifesting this to happen without all the, the, the pieces not being in place. I think Wake the Tiger is a really interesting name. I mean, you're building worlds. I mean, there feels like there is a lot of creativity, but a lot of connection between bringing the business, raising money, doing all those parts with something much more magical than mm. that as well. Talk to me. How, how do you see that? Well, we um, this was happening. It was it was just happening. <laughs> it, it just that that was it. That, and I think that the only way to to have made something like this without having a massive company behind you from a, a visitor attraction company, like the only way to, and is just pure faith mm. and just like this is happening, and you have to just convince everyone else this is happening. And if they don't get on board, then they they miss out, you know. And um, so we we were we were fortunate enough part of um part of the culture recovery fund boomtown got a, a significant part of cultural recovery fund because they were struggling so much with the pandemic but part of their struggle because they're such a big company and they had this warehouse this overhead so they got mm. quite a good one so part of the recovery fund was to like try and invest in and in, not invest create a new company to support the warehouse yes. like, what can you do to take that that w- rent off your bill every month so we used that money and we created a test space, which is where we brought our first investors down to. So that was the December 21. And um, we made four or five rooms. Some of them we kept, some we got rid of, a cafe, and we I did a pitch and we mm-hmm. got the you know, various people down and talked on our behalf. And and we got our first investors, which was great, just, just before Christmas in uh, December 22. Um, <clears throat> and 4th of January, we started building. But we probably only had, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, maybe... 10 percent of a raise right like f- maybe 15 yeah um and so i was pitching do you know i, I just pitching a lot and and well while well, also running the build yeah luke ran all the creative install i ran all the sort of infrastructure install plus all the finance and and pitching and pitching and pitching and and we slowly got there and we got some fantastic investors some um all really nice people um who had faith in us faith in what we were doing and I think the idea was so new. It didn't. There's lots of things. There's about to, I, I was speaking to a gentleman called James Wallman, who's the mm. World Experience Organization. I can't remember the name. Sure. Okay. Um, and he runs that. But there's about twenty, and Sheena Patel as well. And there's about twenty different types of immersive, mm-hmm. like from you know all sorts, from digital to to real life to mm-hmm. actors to to, and so. Bounding around the term immersive was was quite helpful in the start because it it gave someone to go, oh, cool, I know what that is. But mm-hmm. actually, if you actually know what it is, you know that there's, there's quite a wide range there. So we had to try and understand what we're offering and, and persuade other people of what we're offering and under, try and understand it. When we hadn't built it, we had no photographs. It was all mm. sketches. Um, it was all an idea. An idea that we were certain was going to work because people were looking for new ways to experience live events or, mm. or not even live events to 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 new experiences and new yes. ways to enjoy experiences. So we were sure that it was right, and and sort of going back to and maybe I'm wondering a bit. I don't no, know, no, 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 no. Going back to um, Boomtown and and like we make this amazing world for four days. Um, it's it's incredible. It's the I, I, uh, just just to jump in. I've been to thirty festivals globally. Boomtown by far is is the best thing that I've been to. And I think I, one of the things that always impresses me is, and I know that things maybe change over time, but what's always struck me so much is, and I I've, I wanted to ask this question because I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but it feels like every stage, everything is almost run centrally in a way where it feels like the the vision and the immersion is so consolidated it's not like there's you know a, a Bacardi tent doing this and, and you know like other people are, are, are bringing that together but just seeing the way that it operates as one or at least feels like that blew me away it is different I mean even in that way like you, you, we've got a team of 25 core staff that work all year round most festivals have four so I mean that is the overheads on Boomtown are complete the structure of it's different yeah. but what you get is different and it is all centrally organized all yeah. the theater the game all the music everything else and it 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 gives it that cohesiveness and that that experience that, that nobody that I haven't seen anywhere else I mean there's lots of great festivals out there sure. and this one's quite unique though and I think what we wanted to do was was bring that experience cuz 
to the wider demographic rather than it being to a certain music lover or someone that likes camping or mm -hmm. like how can we bring that creativity that storytelling to everyone mm -hmm. and, and that was that was the that was our sort of number one and piece and it's really interesting because one of the things that i loved about boomtown and i think um i i see at least a lot of the same uh drivers in the way that you're describing there for wake the tiger is you know there's a lot of um let's say more niche genres which at a lot of festivals get underserved right and it's like if you're into side trance or gaba or something like that it feels like it's an afterthought in many festivals it's a small tent with very little love care or attention and at boomtown when you go to these places it's like wow it's so amazing to see the same level of love attention respect going into something which may be more niche than you would see at any other festival and it feels very very egalitarian in that way you know no matter what you're there for you're going to get a great experience because it is um you know just equal well inclusive i think is the word inclusive yeah i think we try and try and be inclusive and again we wait the tiger that's one of our, our core principles is uh, core values is, is trying to be as inclusive as possible and we do that through loads of different mechanics how does that work for wait the tiger well i mean in terms of our visitors, we try we do um we've got our community ticket allocation, so we give away over two hundred free tickets a year to to people that have charities or folk that can't afford tickets, and we don't ask them to justify why. If someone's applied for it, then we we give them away, and I, I'm not even sure that we've ever said no to anyone. So, we also do um sensory sessions for folk with sort of different access needs. Um, we do it between two and four a month. So just the, the volume might be reduced or the, the lights might be reduced or there might be a bit more space. Just you know, we reduce the numbers for sure. So we, we try and make sure that the that the, the attraction is there for everyone. One, the sec one that almost brought a tear to my eye, this, the second person that came in when we opened on the 30th of July, 22, and they, well, they, roll, they rolled up in a wheelchair and we were like, okay, cool. Like we tried our best to in factor all this into mm -hmm. the, much of the design as we could. And we're like, okay, number two, right, yeah. we're going to tie. And um, one of the ops managers met the person at the end and um, he was like, he was blown away. He was like, wow. this is the, like one of the first times I felt that I could, I was, it was almost designed as for as much for us as it was for others. And, wow. Um, and while I thought we'd done a good job, I didn't think we'd done that great a job. Yeah. So I was absolutely thrilled. And that's amazing. Yeah, really, really. I mean, that's yeah, really tough with that. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. And in terms of uh, the speed of the traction Wake the Tiger has got, which is, is blown away. I remember seeing on, on you posting on LinkedIn how it was being voted into all of these awards and being recognized mm -hmm. so quickly. How do you explain that? Was that something... Did, you knew it was going to work. Did you think it would get that recognition that quickly? Talk to me about that side. I think the whole journey has sort of had that sort of pace. Um, like from the moment we got our first investment in December 22, and we started building on the 4th of January, we opened on the 30th of July. And this was going taking something from an empty shell. There was no heating or insulation or like there was nothing. It was all plant, And we had to do it all over on top of each other. So mm -hmm. it was incredibly stressful. What Meanwhile, raising money. Do you know, and me like, and there was probably two nights where I was like, "We're done." Only two. That's pretty good. All That's right. Pretty the, good. There was two really right, real where I genuinely thought we were done. Um, and do you know, we found some money. Whether it was a new investor, mm -hmm. whether it was you know whatever, we we found some money to pay the bills. It it only happened right towards the end. Um, and a. Yeah, and it it was a good experience. You know, you've earned it when you've been through that, and so so that had all been really hectic, building that really quick, fast moving, too fast to be honest. You know, if we could have one more thing, it would be more time and, and mm -hmm. money there. But um, but we got open, and um, yeah, it, it 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 just sold really well. Now a lot of people thought it was temporary as well initially, and we have to keep telling people, no, this is a this is a permanent thing. Mm -hmm. you know, London Dungeons, Madden to Swords, whatever. This is this is this is a going to be an icon of of um, of Bristol. Um and yeah, it, the the ticket sales just the tickets kept selling. I mean, it was it was great, you know. And it, um and we went in for some awards, and it was the it was the Bristol Life Awards actually mm -hmm. in Bristol. And um, a my mark sales and marketing director Lucy put put us in for these awards, and her and, and the marketing manager went down, and digital uh, digital marketing manager went down, and um, yeah, they won the Leisure and Tourism Award, and then this is overall award at the end, and. 
we won that as well and there was like and it was like proper awards it was like 800 people in the yeah. in the audience at all businesses and and the, the judges like it was a it was a no-brainer like there was no other person that could a company that could have won it was just like wow that's that's great you know to yeah. get that sort of recognition like so early it's only been trading seven months so <laughs> it's, it's insane. Uh, yeah yeah that's that that really is crazy and do you I mean, where do you see the future of Rate the Tiger? Is it just um, iterating and, and building upon what you've got so that you've got refresh and people can come back every year and something different? Is it new sites? Where do you see us? I think, um, well, we're in, the, we're in the process of, of increasing, we're almost doubling the size of the visitor attraction within the current premises at the moment into the warehouse. Um, and that's really exciting. I, I mean, that's you know building second floors of slides elevators like this it's like yeah i mean that's taking what we've done and and really taking it to the next level really i think and and we want it to be something that is considered in the same light as a london attraction and trying to to engage with people to come come down from london because it's worth it mm -hmm. from or manchester or, or or birmingham wherever um but i think yeah i mean definitely second sites it's definitely something we're you know we're looking at and i think what we what what we love what I love about it is that th there'll never be two wait the tigers out of the same. Mm. So we've got a narrative that runs through it. it. It's sort of it's sort of light touch. It's there. It's, it's you can get into it if you want to. We get have a thing called uh, what do we call it? Um, oh, I've forgotten. Dippers and divers. Skimmers, okay. skimmers, dippers and divers. So folk okay. that just come in and looks folk that look a little bit and people that dive right in and want to yes. understand what's going on and it's like the boom time <coughs> with the narratives uh, that run through right yeah exactly and and we'll um so when we have a, another park it'll it'll be you'll go through a different portal into a different part of the world and there'll be a different part of the same story so mm -hmm. it'll all be interlinked so eventually you need to go to them all to, nice. to understand the story if you want to yeah um and uh it gives us quite a lot of artistic freedom as well of where we go so it's uh yeah, we're really excited about, about doing the next one as well. <laughs> yeah, and do you know where you're going to do that? Yeah, I've got some ideas, yeah. Nice, okay, all right. Well, that'll be one to, to be disclosed later on at some point. So talk, let's talk a little bit about risk. Um, and thank you for sending over some some thoughts around risk you've taken. Sounds like you've got yourself injured and smashed up and, and, <laughs> and doing all sorts of things. So talk to us about your personal risk then. Um, well, uh, my personal journey started... I, I guess when I when I finished university and and I, I I discovered snowboarding when I was at university. I'd always wanted to go skiing with my parents, but we we I didn't have that opportunity and 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 started when I was at university and loved it. And I was like, I'm finishing uni, gonna go and follow the snow. And you know, obviously the parents are okay, son. <laughs> yeah. On you go. So when did my my first season as a chalet host or whatever, like everyone else did, and you know, mom and dad thought I'd be getting back to my engineering job and. Ten years later, <laughs> I was still out there, but they came to it. They came to to be at peace with it. Um, but a lot happened out there. You know, obviously, learned how to to enjoy myself and uh, learned how to promote myself. I think so. I I I I hadn't snowboarded much, and within a couple of years, I managed to get sponsored as a uh, um. So I got started getting some free clothes and wow. boards and stuff, and and that involved. You know, organizing photo shoots and 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 uh, going on trips and and just trying to get in the magazines and mm -hmm. videos and stuff like that, um, and that sort of led one thing to that was going well actually, um, and to 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 balance that up, I also started building snowboard jumps for competitions. Oh, okay, and that's how I got into events. So I um I ended up going all over Europe, building Norway and Switzerland, Holland, France, and everywhere Austria. Um, building these jumps for these big competitions, sitting in the machines sometimes, or doing it with shovels, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, that really kicked off when, like, um, I, I yeah, you talk about risk. I went off a cliff and and uh, I'd done it the day before actually and landed it, okay. and overnight. Right. I was, so it wasn't you didn't accidentally come off a cliff. Oh no 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 it was uh, no no it was uh, it was intentional. <laughs> right. Um, okay. And uh, overnight I was like, oh, I could do a trick off that. <laughs> So I, how, I to, to set the scene. How how big are we talking here? Like, what, what are we talking about? It was about eighteen meters. Okay, so it's so it six, 50, 60 feet. Yeah, it was, um, and yeah, and I just didn't quite get it right, and I just sh sh shattered my cartilage. And uh, unfortunately, at that point, I was I was doing well. I was the mm -hmm. best. I was riding, and I'd been, I'd been invited to a Red Bull Big Air in Sweden. Um, so it was my first international comp. 
Yeah, and I got I just come back from a trip to America doing photo shoot with some legends, and wow. that, it, was, it, was, it was it was that was the you know it was going well, and then I I did that, and then that was me out for a year, and all those moments passed. And how how much of a toll does that have? Right, you know, you're on the cusp of getting to where you want to be, and then obviously a huge setback. I I think. I mean, I hadn't been. It wasn't the first time I'd been injured, but mm-hmm. certainly never been injured for that long. And um, uh, and at that critical moment, I think it when you're sitting in a what a four by six meter apartment in a ski resort, sorry, by snow, stuck on the couch, it's mm. um, it's pretty tough. Yeah. But what I learned from that was it's how to to prepare yourself mentally and actually ed lee i don't know if you're familiar with ed lee promote if he's a presenter for um, ski sunday on okay. bbc he used to uh he used to be a snowboarder in the, the scene as well and he I remember him saying to me because he bust his cartilage or his acl i think it was and he was that's the best thing that ever happened to me he was like he was a very good snowboarder as well um and uh but he got into presenting because of it and you know, he'd done bits and bobs but he then focused and yes and you know he's you know he's excellent he's really good at his job and so I started focusing on my events um, and really started building that out. I ended up creating, um, I created a business for with, with two business partners in Iceland to do, mm-hmm. we did this we did this snowboard camp in Iceland, um, which we were out there for like two months a year. And we had, we, we built a park where you could skate in the half pipe outside the hostel. The mm-hmm. hostel's in a village of 10 houses. Okay. And you were next to a beach that you could surf and it was a 10 minute drive up to the glacier. Nice. And it was Schneefels Jokel, which was the, uh, the in Jules Verne, Journey to the Centre of the Earth. That's the mountain that they went into the centre wow. of the earth. And um, it was an amazing place. And we, so we did that for five years and went out there every year. And that was hard. How long were the camps running for? The camps only ran for like, uh, between two and four weeks, I mm-hmm. can remember. Um, and... Um, so we were out there for about two months. We had to build this part, this ancient machine and, and shovels. And and we had like this just amazing core group of people that came with us, like 10 of us. And we fed them for two months. And I think one year, one of them, a couple of them might have got 100 quid. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, so this I, is a passion project. It, it, well, it was, but it was one of the most, It was I think, still think it's one of the most unique things that ever happened in, in that industry um, because it, it was done for passion and it, you know at the end we shut the business after five years and like took a grand each you know it yeah. wasn't it wasn't a money thing but in terms of building character understanding business and understanding what it takes and how to get them how to motivate a team to mm. keep working and to like of so, passion yeah and yeah. i think that so much and there was a risk there i i would say that it, perhaps I don't know if it was necessarily, there was, was financial risk, of course. It wasn't necessarily a huge scale, but, you know, it was, there was financial risk, there was reputational risk, mm-hmm. and there was, but there was experience, and I think it was the combination of all the experiences that I've had through my life that it allowed me to to understand and manage the, the risk, in this case, of, of, of decision-taking as, as, I, as I got older and, mm-hmm. and, and more experienced through through my personal life and, and through work as well. Yeah, really, really interesting. So so you were running that for five years, and, and that was during um, summer months, did you say? Yeah, that was like uh, May and June. Fine, May and June. So what was the rest of your time looking like? <laughs> um, oh, cool. uh, well, winters, I was I, live in, I was living in teen, so we went, we had just, uh, me and my, my wife, Tash, lived in teen, and, and we, so we, um, <laughs> I would, um, I'd go back and design some jumps and she would curse that she would have to go painting and decorating in flats because yeah. she was a photographer as well. So she, um, um, but, um, eventually that, that stopped and she managed to do other things. But we, it, it, as, as I grew older and developed, I, be, I planned, there was a Red Bull event in Trafalgar Square mm-hmm. many years ago. I, I designed that and we installed that. And so we started doing, I started getting into more right. m- mainstream, like, um, UK based and, and and events and so you were building that reputation for yourself, getting involved with all these different projects and, and, and brands and, yeah. and 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 it's quite interesting as well if you look at the 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 people that were involved in in if, if in, in snowboarding at that point and who they are now that generation of, of five to ten years of snowboard UK snowboarders they're some of the top leading people in the world not just in skiing and snowboarding but in in multiple different Really? sectors yeah and it was just that group of, of people is quite quite inspiring That's so interesting why do you think that is 
I don't know. I, I don't know. Like even in, in Snowden, we, everyone didn't understand how these Brits who don't even have any mountains really have, have, yeah. are doing so well. But you know, you've got you've got you know, John, who is the global head of ladies Nike marketing. You've got um, no, you know Ed, who's on BBC Spo- um, mm-hmm. Ski Sunday. The 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 list goes on. And you've got Tim and Gendel who who's smashing it. There's there's tons of great people. I don't understand. I think it was. I don't know if there was a mentality around it at that point or. Uh, I just a desire like th- there were everyone it was hard working people yeah. who were just up for it well someone once um someone was described to me one of my friends is a skateboarder and she says to me the reason why she thinks people who have you know been skating for years and years since they were young kids whatever it might be go so far is because there's that mentality of you do the trick a hundred times till you land it <laughs> you know if you want to land that trick you do it until it lands and if that's the mentality that mentality will take you very very far right if you're going yeah. to do it until it gets done then there's very little that can stop you yeah and I'd, but also taking the hits mm. like you know you, t- you have to take a lot of hits a lot of rejection in, in life and um, and i think uh yeah i think i think that that really helps i was i was thinking about obviously when i was coming up here and and what 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 the word was what would it and i thought it's the fight like you have to mm-hmm. fight every day about something you know you get the odd day don't you you get the odd day where you're like oh do you know what everything's all right but there's always something that and i can think back all the way back to fighting to get my first sponsor like having to mm. walk to this almost before mobile phones i had to walk to the phone box like putting my thing phone uh, pestering people to try and give me a free snowboard mm-hmm. like um sending them a photo i had or whatever and um you had to fight for that then you have to fight to get your sponsors for your events or fight to get money from the bank fight yeah. to you, you, or, you know i don't know it's, it's, not, it's not always an aggressive fight but yeah it's a, it's a it could be a mental fight or a, like i think there's just that that challenge and you've got to be up for that fight you do and you have to persevere and I, mm. it's funny me and my friend were talking about this in the weekend is just um you know when we were teenagers like in order to get something done you had to physically go somewhere or you had to know someone who knows someone who could help you do this thing. now it's like utter convenience whatever i want <laughs> i can get it to me right now immediately or within 24 hours and obviously that does allow us to accelerate things incredibly quickly and it allows us to um you know make things happen which is great but you do lose a lot of the perseverance and you do lose a lot of the required grit to see it through when it is so convenient yeah it's definitely too much on hand at the moment for sure yeah the um i think i don't know someone said to me <laughs> recently there's a there's maybe a generational thing as well with um i don't know if it's gen x or gen z or whatever but that 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 perseverance and this is maybe not fair and a bit of a generalization because mm. obviously not everybody's like this but that things are a lot easier to get hold of mm-hmm. you know and i think that's good in some ways but i think it you know it's not not always a win and it, it, it's quite scary you know how that that can develop even further in the future with ai and, and everything else and, and yeah. where where that's going to go and again so maybe just bringing it bring back to risk as well like the the and uh, i mean i'm no expert on ai but this this ease of getting stuff and the cheapening of it is is reducing risk. Mm-hmm. Like even for um for this new development we're doing at Wait the Tiger, we've to to try and flesh out not our designs but mood boards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We can we can we can do that a lot easier now. Um, and you know I understand all the the artist concerns around mood boarding, but when you're trying to explain a concept to a to a a designer who's going to put it into play you're like i don't want this but like that sort of color and that sort of look and you can actually pull an image up that Mm -hmm. you know isn't sitting for three four days with a sketching person which is bad news for the sketching person but and without an ego as well right because sometimes that's a difficult thing you know when you're working with artists is you know you don't want to be like well you need to make it 10 percent less intense or whatever it is right it can be a bit well for me anyway it can be a bit uh a bit of a challenging thing to try and meld the creative vision into you know what you need it to be but with ai when you can literally just say 10 percent less moody or whatever it might be and it, and it will spin it around for you is uh is incredible but yeah there are there are lots of um challenges that will come with but that, that assists with risk again you know, mm. so i keep bringing it back to risk but like the um that's what we're here for yeah, yeah is if you can get an image created that is along the lines of what you 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 want 
you're you're reducing the parameters that the designer needs to play within because ultimately they're designing your product and you know that this is what we want can you can you take it to the next level with construction designs or whatever and you're so you're reducing the risk in terms of reducing design costs and mm-hmm. um, because of their time will be less even if they're still designing it any errors that you might have foreseen in in terms of the process of how it's fabricated so there's this i mean i'm not a huge ai person but that that's definitely been a helpful piece for us on mood boards and and and, and concept briefs yeah absolutely i think you know if you i like to try and be as grateful as possible every single day right there are so many people in the world who are in very, very unfortunate situations. I think the least that any of us could do who are in the top 5% of fortune, you know, globally, we can be grateful every single day. But where I am so grateful is that if you are part of that generation which grew up with the need for perseverance, hustle, grit, and then can leverage the convenience of the new tooling that comes in, you know, you really do have an amazing opportunity mm. to to leverage both of those things to go very, very far. And I think it's really exciting if you do have that mentality. Um, and it also makes it feel much more uh, accessible as well. You know, before, if you wanted to create concepts if you wanted to build out marketing funnels you know you need three four people you need different skill sets now anyone with a decent um, knowledge of, of how to use these tools can make an amazing start at something and i think for a lot of people who maybe have been precluded from those opportunities previously it's a really exciting time it makes them more accessible for yeah. sure and i like that there was an article in the guardian yesterday that is that I don't know. Like art's now privileged. Basically, it's mm. like it's so difficult to to cost a living. Like, you know, what's what's going to go first? And the creativity is the start of everything. Whether it's a, you know, a nuclear bomb or whether it's a, a, a new car or a vacuum mm. cleaner or whatever. Every, it all starts with a creative thought, a seed, and that, that you know, and that that uh, is something that I don't think is valued enough by you know perhaps the government or certain people within the, within the. Um, within the country is that we need that creativity because out of creativity comes ideas comes comes a- economy comes growth comes yeah all those things absolutely and i i think and and this is the other side of the, the AI, ai argument is that in many ways it does t- and, and the way that we are so attached to electronics and devices it does take us further away from the interconnectedness with the universe and where creativity comes from uh, but on the other hand i don't know I, I'm in very two minds about whether we as uh, beings are supposed to be driving further back to nature or is it actually all about progress and evolution and is everything data and that's where we're trying to get to and are the two the same? It's uh, I know this sounds like a... Well, well that's, quite, that's quite interesting because that's the, the fundamentals of Wait the Tiger. Is, it, okay. it, it discusses that, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the, um, we, I think the... It's probably a, a, a combination of both. Mm. Um, I think uh, there's a lot to be learned from from the past, from from the way things were done with nature. We are nature. I mean, I think we need to remember that. Yeah. You know, and, and but we also have science and we have intellect now. And I think it's about harnessing those those pair. There is no single silver bullet to any sort of, of the current problems. But I think there's a there's a combination of things, and I think it's about harnessing both of them and. With Wait the Tiger, what what you do is you, you walk through a portal into this other world of Meridia. Okay. And you discover this derelict factory where they've been, uh, they've been, they've, they're ahead of us in the climate crisis, you know, and they're, they're trying to recover from it. And they're starting to, to have experiments to see how they can, to create fauna and, you know, food and, and, and find, don't want to give too much away. Yeah, yeah, find, yeah find, sure. You know, find uh, find solutions. Yeah, and um, but all of that, a it, it all ties back into sort of discover discovery of, of yourself and 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 what what's what's what we're doing with with nature and climate and and so that mm. the, it, it, there's no preaching in it, but it, there's an mm. underlying na- level there. But there's also technology in it as well. So there's there's like little ga- whether it's games or other yeah. bits and pieces. And I think I think there's definitely a synergy there. But I think. As a whole, as a world, you know, we, we we should look at how much we consume. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I uh, I'll just put a, a marker here in case we want to edit out the next question and go back to it. But to me, it sounds like you are creating a real life uh, DMT DMT trip experience. <laughs> is, is how I would perceive that based on what you've said. Um, well, it's obviously a. a, a 
a lot of families come and, and yeah. enjoy it. We, uh, I would say, oh, look, like he came up with a phrase to, to, um, it would perhaps be like a psychedelic attraction. There's, there's quite mm. a lot of focus around mycelium and fungi, but that's, do you know, what everyone, it's got the stigma of being all oh, magic mushrooms and tripping, but there's, there's, yes, there's that, but there's also the benefits of, of, of it, like, which are, I don't know if you've seen them, um, um, amazing fungi or whatever it is on yeah, Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's insane. It's, it's mind blowing. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, part of, of, of Wait the Tiger is, is focused on, on the mushrooms and what, what, what they can do and, and, certainly in this new development area that, that, that we're developing that we're doing it's um very much looking at the journey of of, of yourself and, mm. and looking within your own head effectively and yes it, it you know it, let's say there's some brighter colors up there yeah yeah and it's um it's a really interesting one because you know for me this is something which is uh you know a secret which a lot of society has not had it the ability to access for various reasons narrative maybe it's a good thing maybe it's a bad thing but it's something which has been with us for the entirety of our humanity yeah. and by not having the awareness of it and not having the understanding that these things are out there i think we are missing and we are not having the full human experience well i mean i, I think um their teachings aren't they the teaching of elders that, that's been lost in the western world for mm -hmm. sure it's still in indigenous people it's still there um, but it, it's it's very much lost um, in the Western world. But Luke, uh, my business partner, is um, quite deep into a lot of this um, and spends quite a lot of time. He's been to Peru and met, met some elders there, but he also spends time with um, a gentleman called Mac, who um, is, is based in the Southwest, who's, a, who's very much an elder and, and the, the incredibly wise man mm -hmm. um and i learn from luke who learns from mac to a certain extent we you know we have these conversations and it, it, it's really interesting to see to see how that how that develops and what we can do and i, I don't think it 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 doesn't necessarily always mean wholesale change we don't have to flatten all the buildings but what we sure. we have to go off psychedelic you know question but like it comes back to it comes back to government and, and i again i'm going back to it the government aren't managing the risk of the climate crisis by and I can. I'm no politician, but the 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 policy decisions that they making now or have been making for the last few years, and and and, and business leaders making the same decisions as well. So it's not mm. all on politicians that could could prevent with minimum lesser impact, like solar panels and all mm. new builds, or no more um, gas boilers. Just th th these are simple things that it would take like take industry five, ten years or whatever with parts and production line, but Unless you start that process, because every every gas boiler that gets installed's got what a ten year, fifteen year yeah. life, so it it keeps going, and I mean and that's just that's just one tiny thing, but and it's not that simple, and I I get that, I'm not that naive to think that you know you can just no, but but you know if the will was there, you could you could right? so what and what's the you know what's the what's the what's stopping them is it you know, the lobbying fact, is I mean, funds <laughs> I mean it's the fact that. Every single politician indirectly owns shares in every single fossil fuel company. You know, it's it's literally the pitch going to them is, well, you could lo lower your own bottom line, right, by divesting away from fossil fuels and into things which maybe you aren't indexed as highly in, in terms of your own personal portfolio. You know, it's the same reason we have housing crises, because the private equity companies who own a lot of the um, housing um associations I don't know the right word for it where it's below standard care where below mm. standard conditions who are the shareholders in those private equity companies they're the same people giving them the contracts and I know it's a, a controversial thing to say um and it's not a conspiracy but it's, theory. it's sort of blind money isn't it because you, you you've just you've just got your maybe your money in a fund yeah and you don't know necessarily where the funds in putting yeah. it but I think it, and getting back to that original question was um I think the the healing powers of, of, of mushrooms if we if we just to look at that in nature as well, it, 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 a substantial you see what it's done for folk with depression or PTSD mm. or like it there is it's and there's, there's so much science getting behind it now in America. It, yeah. America's starting to embrace it a little bit and and here less so, but I, I feel it's coming I, um, I, totally. And seeing, for example, you know, I, I, I was having this conversation over the weekend. I think we are about to hit a very very interesting point, which does give me a lot of optimism because. When you have got 
um, the head of neuroscience at Stanford University, now starting to talk about the benefits of psychedelics mm -hmm. on mental health, PTSD, etc. And where you have the most funding going to any university, really, in the US, ha Harvard, Stanford, um, I think you're going to see so much creativity and so much more awareness coming out if there is a uh, support of the use of psychedelics in these environments and that's where the funding is going. Surely you're going to see a lot more in terms of uh, people trying to tackle these most important problems. I have a theory based on zero scientific evidence <laughs> other than my gut. But, um, you know, is there any doubt in my mind that when you look at the 1950s, 1960s, the, um, you know, coming to uh, awareness of LSD and that leading to people's desire to get us to the moon and to start exploring our universe and start understanding our universe and i don't think it's a mystery that a lot of that's coming out of cambridge and those universities and theories of stephen hawking and and arthur c clark who were who were visualizing somehow getting these visions <laughs> of how we get from a to b and i think it scared a lot of people at, at, who were interested in entrenching status quo how much people were saying there are things that we need to do differently and change them and maybe i'm being optimistic maybe being naive but the amount of study and the amount of research now going into the use of psychedelics hopefully we do get to a point again where people are more in tune with what's going on in the universe more in tune with the world around them and if the funding can follow that it can only be a good thing yeah i think so I mean, I think you nailed it there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very rare that I do that, especially with zero backing beyond it. But um, no, it's, 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 it's a really fascinating one. It's really fascinating. So I've got a few questions that I ask everyone. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm very excited to hear your answers around this. So what is the single biggest risk you've taken and what was the outcome? You can define risk in a few different ways. So I think in terms of financial, commitment I, I would say weight the tiger is definitely the the biggest risk that we've, i've taken um i also think managing that risk it's not just my money i've never looked at it it's just my money uh, we have 22 23 investors mm -hmm. they've all backed myself and Luke primarily in the first instance and chris and um i need to not let them down so you know, I'm, I I take that very seriously. I've always said that in all, all my all my pitches, and um, so yeah, managing that risk is, is for me that's that's the biggest thing I think I've done. But I mean, personally, I think there's there's different there's different aspects. There's some cliffs I shouldn't have jumped off. Mm. <laughs> 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 no, that's a great answer, and I think um, you know, when you and it, it's it's refreshing to hear as well because I think a lot of people do see it as well it's not my money and i'm you know i'm not necessarily i don't have as much committed um and i think the fact that you guys did raise the amount that you did for a non-tech company during that time um does mm. speak to the vision and, and you know it's incredible to see how well you guys have executed and, and i'm excited to see where it keeps on going okay the second question i have for you is is there anything you wish you did differently um i think with around surrounding that particular risk, I think I mean I would love to have had more time and money to have done it in a more organised manner. Um, it was a needs must basis, but I think um, maybe more due diligence and some of my s longer term suppliers um, and a better understanding of that. We were going into a new market. We come at festivals, but going into visitor attractions permanent, and there was mm -hmm. some things that you would use in both. But actually, you should be not necessarily working with the same suppliers and different 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 aspects so i think um maybe uh, ultimately it's fine and it, it, it's sort of being managed but it's um yeah a little bit more understanding in that i think would have been good i mean there's probably a million things small things trying to think of the big ticket numbers is, is probably there's that, that one in particular yeah and is wake the tiger the first permanent fixture as it were that you that you've built yes okay and and is that process fundamentally very very different in its core oh it's really different i mean it's um similar skill sets in terms of project management and, and budget management all that sort of things but in terms of the regulations uh, primarily like building regs fire accessibility that sort of side of things is all different and then sort of in terms of the the, the once you built it the operation is is different as well it's um 
I, <laughs> I said this at, uh, up in the Boomtown office the other day. It was it's like the week before when you build a festival, it, it ramps up and ramps up, and you, you know, it's chilled sort of let's say September through to January. Like you're planning, it's nice. You're setting your budgets, you're doing your thing, you're coming up with your ideas. Then it starts to build up all the way through. And for May, June, July, depending on what time of year it is, it's it's pretty full on. Then you get on site. Mm -hmm. It's actually every day you do on site, it, it sort of gets less stressful because that's one less day you need to think about. Right. Because okay. you planned it from the <laughs> moment. So, so I always like, oh, cool, that day's done. Less yeah. to think about. But then you get to the final week, the final two days before the, the show, the show week. That's always intense. Doesn't matter how well planned you are. Like you always have a ton of stuff coming in at the end. Running a permanent venue it's sort of like that all the time. It's not got necessarily the 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 intensity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's got the urgency because if you want a new a new line of stock or you want to change a, a process with the team or you need to, you have to change it, but you can see you've had a maybe you've had a complaint come in or maybe maybe something's just not working or creatively it's not landing, whatever it might think. The time it takes to mm. to, to to change that is it's like turning a tanker sometimes and you're like why is this taking so long but it because everyone has so much to do and we don't have the luxury of having copious amounts of people yes. you know we have a lot of people but not enough you know you could always do more to move things quickly and i think yeah it also always just feels like oh we're not we, we've got to do this now we've got to do this and you're so you're always you're always uh, got that sort of urgency of show wow. weeks so that's for me that's the sort of difference is, is running a 365 day a year company that's got folk coming in almost every day trying to make those changes and it's mm. so it's always it's always there so. yeah it must be incredibly incredibly tough and i guess i i feel there may be fewer variables though that could go wrong than versus at a festival or am i totally wrong about oh that? no yeah you yeah yeah fine so so it's 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 always on but probably not as intense as that you know four day period no i would say not 100 percent. it's definitely mm. not got the intensity yeah. of it the what you you don't know what you're going to get at well that's why you, you know you get experienced event managers and who plan these things out but you know you can't the weather's always a is that the biggest is that the biggest one if you had to put it down the weather weather yeah the, yeah and then for a period of maybe you know terrorism is a big one depending where you're where you're you know, if you're london city center or city center event i think it's it's, it's more likely mm. um and then crowd crowd control. Crowd I think control. I'd say they're the, the three biggies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, last year at Boontown was uh, the, the weekend, but it was th like thirty four degrees. Oh. That was it. Was brutal. Yeah, it was brutal. Mm. Um, so yeah, I guess it can go. But both we got ways. we got um uh, got like misting cannons in on the pits that they got sent out. Um, nice. Like Chris and Luke managed to pull that together, and that well, that made a real difference. But yeah, it was it was it was warm. It, <laughs> It was warm and dusty. Yeah, was <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it was actually very cool. Uh, on the first day, I think it was on the Thursday that I got there and coming down into, I guess, into Old Town where it looked so much more apocalyptic because of the dust. Yeah. It actually looked pretty great from that side of things. It looked amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Nice. Okay. Um, next question I've got for you is, what does it take to be successful? Um, I think we probably touched on this earlier, but um, I mean, hard work perseverance commitment desire i could keep some words out but i think ultimately you you got want it mm. i think um very few people are given pre presented with success you need to you sort of need to earn it and you you generally i would say we're, are better at it if if you've earned it and you've you've understood it and you've understood the what it takes to get there and when when um when I started doing events, I worked for free. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, maybe I, I was privileged, but I, I certainly wasn't given any money by anyone. I just had very low living costs and, and just I I would manage try and manage my own time as best I could. But um, and I got experience that way. And, and then as as I came in and started doing, so I'd run events. And then I came when we moved back to the UK. Eventually, um. I started, I did a few skate events and, and other few bits and pieces, but there's obviously not much snowboarding events happening over here. So yeah. I slowly got into festivals and, and I, I'd worked just every, I've done every job. So like you can talk with, um, you know, understanding to people about how difficult it is to put out Harris fencing or mm -hmm. like how tricky managing artists on a stage is or whatever it might be. And, and, and that I think gives you a, a respect and I think when you've got that respect from people, which I, I'd like to think I have, I hope I have, um, I think you 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 become a better leader, mm. um, and and you can become more successful. Mm. 
That's an amazing answer. Um, I really, really like that one. I really like that a lot. Okay. Um, my second to last. Second to last? Maybe third to last. Yeah. Third to last. What scares you? I don't think this was on the list. Yeah, we just added it recently, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what scares me? Well, obviously, um, if we say in business, family aside, so, mm-hmm. like, you know. Um, oh, you've thrown that at me. Hold on, give me a sec, give me a sec. What, no what's, rush, what's no scares? rush. That's quite, that's quite a big question. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, I hate letting people down. I think, I think, um, obviously, don't want to be a failure, but I think letting people down is 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 probably the thing that that keeps keeps me going. And so, yeah, and I think I, it almost harps back to, you know, there's sixty people working at Wait the Tiger now, mm-hmm. twenty three investors, you know, obviously reputation and, and that aside, but I can sort of take whatever. I'd like to think I'm big enough to take responsibility for whatever outcome there is on anything, and it's you know whether it's my fault or my success. Sure. Um, but to to let down your staff or or or, or investors, I think would that that would that would be pretty disappointing. Yeah. No. I, I, it's something I totally resonate with, and it's it's interesting. I was speaking to someone recently about this, and you know they said that in the most biological way, um, being a founder, being a leader is. It's the most hunter gatherer you can get, right? You get the kill, we win, everyone eats. We don't get the kill, we lose, everyone starves, right? We got sixty mouths to feed. How you know? However you see it, you know it's so. It does go so fundamentally to our core of you know what what we're trying to achieve and, and what we're trying to do. So I, I I totally get that. And I think there's another uh, unseen part of being a founder of an investor backed business, which is a lot of people see founders as the top of the organization. In reality, there are two organizations. There's the internal, which is your employees, your customers, your partners, and then there's the external, which is your investors. And actually, we're in the middle of a sandwich of the <laughs> external organization and the internal organization. And you have upwards pressure and downwards pressure. Um, but yes, you are the bridge between the two organizations. I think there's, I think, I mean, it, it's the same point, but sort of extrapolating on it a little bit as well is pre- trying to predict future market i think is is um where you know you've got opportunities to grow what are you going to do you've got some money you've just raised some money you've got some finance you've got a plan obviously mm-hmm. is it the right plan like that that is quite a scary thing you know and ultimately we did it what and look at when luke and i chat nothing is scarier than the first one yes because like we didn't even have a no, we had a plan, but we didn't know if it was going to work. Whereas now we've at least got proof that it works, and all you're trying to do is pick the next direction mm. that that's going to be the next theme or the next um, the next bit of tech, whatever it might be that you're going to put into the park. And and I wouldn't say that's as scary as the other thing, but that's that's a sort of breakout of it because ultimately mm. that is what will define success or failure if it's your next product, isn't it? Mm-hmm. If the next product flops, it's harder to raise money because your your track record's blemished and yeah. your income's. And or your overheads have gone up, and your income may have not matched that increase, and so I think it, it all ties into the same piece. But mm. it's um, yeah, that's that business wise, that's definitely the yeah the, the pressure point. All right, what are you proudest of? I think I am proudest of walking my own path. Um, I, as I said before, I left university. I, my parents were not happy with me not getting a pr- proper job as they call it um i've never worked for anyone never had a salary of any from anybody um done some bar jobs when i was a student and stuff but and so i think getting to where i am without anyone really helping that's a great one yeah thank you um and uh, yeah it's it's uh another one which a lot of people say when they come here is you know it's it there are so many moments especially early on when you're walking your own path where there might be that question of like, oh, I would these other people who followed a more traditional route in that first 10 years are normally further ahead of mm. you by the traditional markers um, than when you go your own path. And I think sticking to that path is a very difficult thing to do and a brave thing to do. And, and you know, it, it just goes back to the perseverance bit. If you stick on it and uh, you don't take no for an answer and, and you keep on fighting, you'll, you'll get to where you need to be. It's all been so organic, though. Like, 
I knew I wanted to go snowboarding. There was nobody who was stopping me going snowboarding and going snowboarding. Like I, I go all in, yeah, and do stuff and like. So I, I did it, and I was like, that, "That's me. That's what I'm doing now." And then it, you know, from there, I, I, I um, I got a real nice transition because actually, I, I don't know if I can expand on this, but like the um, so when you're out doing those winter seasons, like I said, I've done ten or so, I think, and mm-hmm. stopping's quite hard because you're sort of there, you're doing it, your friends are there. Like obviously, my knees weren't so good and. But I got this opportunity. I ended up managing the Nike Global Ski and Snowboard team. Wow! So I still got to snowboard. Was sort of traveling around, doing a thing with the team. Um, and after the first year, I did it for three years, I think. Um, not as a, just as a contract through my mm-hmm. business as well. I was doing my own events and everything else. And um, my wife was like, "Can I just go back to the UK and do my do my Emmy?" I was like, "Yeah, cool." So we moved back to to UK, and then so I still got to sort of snowboard and fly it like fly around and do nice. all those things go to the x games go to russia go wherever it was we were going but was back in the uk and then after a couple of years i was like i'm done with this I'm yeah, like, yeah. Like, like babysitting pro skiers <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not into this anymore so um and then that's when you got to, you got to you know got to move on and that was actually quite a big um a, a big a moment that was my biggest contract mm. um that i had it was regular income into the business and um as so i went to business advisor um i was like look I don't want to do this anymore. Do you think, do you think this is a bad movie? He's like, you need to keep that. That's your best contract. And I walked out of the room. I was like, no. Nah. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so like, I, but that was when that was common sense. That was your, that was your sort of nine to five. Like, no, that, of course you keep that contract. That's, and then that was your gut going, mm. you know, that's not the right thing to do. And mm. so, yeah, followed the gut. Very, very interesting. And it's uh, another one which goes back to the reason why we should pay more attention to being connected with ourselves is your gut will always tell you what you should be doing. Now, whether or not it pans out in the way you expected it, if you don't follow your gut, you will spend the next four or five years regretting that decision. E- e- just because you'll never know what's on the other side. But you know, though, don't you? You know when when you do it. Yeah. Well, you know when you followed it and when you haven't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, how exactly. often, when you haven't followed it, have you been wrong? And I'll say it's a lot. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. Okay, my last one for you. 15-year-old Graham walks in the room right now. What are you telling him? I would say, and I'm still guilty of this, so I would definitely say this, that <laughs> stop comparing yourself to others. Mm. doesn't matter how successful I am. I always don't feel that I'm good enough, uh, regardless of whether it's you know sport or business or whatever. I, and I played a lot of sport when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, at a reasonably good level at different sports and it was just never I was always comparing myself to like your your best your best person I'm not there I'm not at the Olympics or I'm not this or I'm not that and oh, just give yourself a break like literally just try and enjoy the moment and 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 be the best you can be and you know nobody can really ask for more than that Graham what do you want to plug uh, Wait the Tiger obviously come to Wait the Tiger it is amazing leave yourself at the door love that and have an hour and a half of otherworldly experience and um, and just relax and, and immerse yourself. And where can people find you? Uh, we're in Bristol, um, awaitthetiger.com. Um, and obviously on all the socials, you'll see loads of images and stuff. It, it all looks really cool and really amazing on there. We also do some some awesome um, quarterly events where we do, like, they're called Big Bangers. We've got our summer one coming up at the end of June where we... It, 500 people we've got actors there's cabaret there's music and the park's all open and it's all it's really like you you enter the world of meridia for one of their annual celebrations looking back in the past it's it's lots of fun yeah amazing graham thank you so much for coming on the show man really appreciate it my pleasure it's been an absolute joy thanks for watching the episode and if you haven't subscribed please hit subscribe below so that you can support the podcast and we can keep on bringing you amazing new guests If you want to see the other amazing episodes in this podcast, click into our series section. As ever, if there are any other guests or topics you want us to explore, just let me know in the comments and we'll do our best to bring someone in.